Have you heard about the story of uh, eugenics? No. Are you familiar with a eugenics story? No. No. You know, a sterilization program and so in the past, although not... not uh... No, but now I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? Have you heard about the eugenics program or no. the sterilizations? Yeah. Have you heard about it? Yeah, vaguely. Yes? And what do you... What, do, what have you heard about it? Oh, I don't know. I no? Don't know. Yeah. You don't know exactly? <laughs> no. <or? laughs> Sorry. Eugenics? Yeah. What's eugenics? Ah. <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> I was um, 13 and I was molested. I got pregnant. The social worker came over and she had my grandmother to sign a consent form. The welfare department had told my grandmother that if she didn't sign those papers, she would not receive supplement foods. My grandmother signed an X and when they took my son, they sterilized me at the same time. Normally, you know, now I'm thinking, I'm trying to ask myself, why didn't they wait since my body was so young, you know, and my body wasn't really ready to have a baby. You know, my body was already traumatized from the delivery or, or from the rape. Or they didn't even say anything to me about this. You know, my grandmother didn't understand what she was signing an X to because my grandmother was illiterate. I was raped twice. I was raped by the perpetrator. And I was also raped by the state of North Carolina because they took something from me. I didn't know I was sterilized until I had turned 19 after I had gotten married. The doctor actually explained to me, you've been butchered. They said that I was feeble-minded. I'm not feeble-minded. Was the official reason? That was, that was the official reason for having me sterilized. You know, what I believe it was because I was black. I was from a poor environment. And they probably felt like I was going to end up just like other people. I mean, what kind of government is this? I mean, I don't believe that this government allowed a group of people to sit there and say what was right for another person. When the eugenics movement began in America, Americans thought of this as a very hopeful science. There wasn't much talk of sterilization. There was much attention, though, to better breeding. And so the word eugenics became very popular. Eugenics at the time was understood to be a science. And given that this was a science, uh, the Carnegie and Rockefeller uh, philanthropies uh, were interested in general in supporting the development of good science. Andrew Carnegie gave money to 500 universities, colleges, and institutions. In all, he gave away over $200 million. The list is long of those who, at the beginning of the 20th century, put their hopes in this new science coming straight from Europe. Towards the end of his life, Darwin became worried. A dark future awaited humanity, where in our civilization the process of natural selection doesn't play a role. What's more, the renewing of our population is due more to the lower class rather than the middle or higher class. Galton, Darwin's cousin, created in 1883 the word eugenics, the science of genetic breeding. When we say eugenics today, the word has a violent and pejorative connotation. We forget that at the turn of the century, the word eugenics had a positive connotation. 
Eugenic movements were well established. They developed with consent from governing powers. They were popular and recruited large numbers of doctors, hygienists and city planners who were proud and honoured to belong to such organisations. From 1900, eugenic organisations multiplied in Europe. The first was created in Berlin in 1905 by the Dr. Plutz and a psychiatrist Houdin. It was the movement for racial hygiene. Racial hygiene was designed to prevent weakness, illness, disabilities, and for the unfit to reproduce. There could be a fear of degeneration, a term that was used from the 1880s, which came from the vulgarization of Darwin's thinking and influenced by the observation of societies as if they were natural history objects. Eugenics, with the fear of degeneration, without wanting to discredit the real concerns about global warming, but we can see the same type of overlapping between politics and science around a fear or a concern, and we announce a catastrophe. The English eugenics organization presided over by one of Darwin's sons was founded in 1907. The novelist H.G. Wells wrote that year, our duty is to inquire what this utopia will make of the infirm, the idiots and the mad, the drunkards, the mean and the stupid, too stupid to be of use to society. We need to resort to a type of surgery on society. It was in the United States that the first sterilization laws appeared in 1907. In 1910, close to New York, the Eugenics Record Office became the center for American eugenics research. The institution that emerged still exists today. What is Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory now? One of the most distinguished laboratories for the pursuit of molecular biology and molecular genetics in the world. I just want to film the former building of the eugenics uh, record office. You know, it really has no connection to the laboratory today, and it, it would make sense to do that. But uh, it's an uh, historical documentary, it's not about the present. You know, I don't think that there'd be any discussion on the subject. They are embarrassed by it. I think they should live more comfortably with it because it doesn't characterize Cold Spring Harbor today by any means. And they should say this is what went on there, it was wrong, and we are now have gone past it now for more than half, a, well more than half a century. When the Eugenics Record Office was founded in 1910, it was meant to be a place where people studied families. Charles Davenport, who was the director, was focused, like his hero, Francis Galton, on family traits. And they looked for families that they called degenerate, right? So families where there was alcoholism, families where there was so-called feeble-mindedness, families where there was illegitimacy. Uh, families where there was prostitution and what have you. And then they would do interviews and ask about the parents and the grandparents. But this was a pedigree chart of the famous Jukes family and it got so large that they decided to make it in a circle because they could contain more people this way. And why was it made? It was made to show that some 900 individuals who ended up in the prisons of New York were descended from the same woman, Margaret, the mother of criminals. Harry Laughlin had projected that we needed to be 15 million Americans sterilized. In 1914, Laughlin was asked to write a model law. And Harry Laughlin said, 
this law should be used to sterilize 10, perhaps 15 million people who represent the bottom tenth of the American population. And when the newspapers picked up that headline, people laughed. The reaction um, was strong against him. His plan was really to simply eliminate people who would cause social costs like crime and poverty. And then he thought you could do that if you just didn't let people have children. When Virginia passed its sterilization law in 1924, there was a need to see whether it would be upheld by the courts of the United States. And so the doctors at the Virginia Colony for the Epileptic and the Feeble-Minded, an institution near Lynchburg, Virginia, chose a young lady named Carrie Buck as the first person to be sterilized. I met her in 1983, and she told me how she had been falsely accused of being promiscuous, of being an unfit mother, of being a moral degenerate. When we asked to film the former institution where Carrie Buck found herself, we were told that most of the building no longer existed. But in going to see it ourselves, it seems that the building is, in fact, still there. The evidence was that Carrie's feeble-mindedness was inherited. This was determined by giving an IQ test to her mother, who also had been in the Virginia colony. She flunked. Uh, and to Carrie, who also failed it, uh, and she had an illegitimate daughter named Vivian, who was then about six or eight months old. And a nurse said that she seemed to be feeble-minded as well. First it went to the Virginia Court of Appeals, and then it went to the United States Supreme Court. The decision was rendered in 1927 by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who is regarded as one of the great progressive justices in the United States. And so he said, in the end, uh, that three generations of imbeciles are enough. Carrie's mother, Carrie, and Vivian. Carrie Buck was sterilized at the Lynchburg Colony and thousands of people were sterilized there after her. More than 8,000 people in Virginia were sterilized under the eugenics laws. More than 20,000 in California, and the rest of the United States, as many as 60,000 people were sterilized. It's always surprising to me how few people actually have heard this story. It's not something we're proud of in America. In Hitler and in Mein Kampf, there is not one original idea. It was a conglomerate of ideas, ideas that were absorbed by a self-taught man who had no intellectual discipline, so gives off a mishmash of rather extraordinary intelligence. But here is where the dominant themes of eugenic thinking from the 1900s, 1910s and 1920s are found. In 1931, the psychiatrist Rudin, co-founder of the Racial Hygiene Organization, became director of the Psychiatric Institute in Munich. He also became one of the three authors of the Nazi eugenic law of July 1933. This psychiatric research institute in Munich was the main, if not the only, in any case the biggest, psychiatric research institute in the world. Also, in 1925, this institute was one of the biggest investments of the Rockefeller Foundation in Europe. The Rockefeller Foundation donated $325,000. This building started operations as early as summer 1928. Rudin's research program was in principle quite simple. How to establish in psychiatry the influence that genetic factors play in psychological disorders.
They carried out research on schizophrenia, on manic depressive psychosis, which we call today a bipolar disorder. Then it was known as mental immaturity or weak-spirited. So it's not surprising that German doctors like Rudin, who had been waiting for decades, greeted the Nazi law as a victory. Finally, they had obtained a law that they had been demanding for many decades. When we observe the first months under Hitler's regime, we're struck by how fast Hitler himself put into place the first eugenics law, that of the sterilization of individuals considered inferior. The Germans took uh, inspiration from the American law and from Buck v. Bell uh, in establishing their own sterilization law. The law for the prevention of hereditary diseased offspring was passed on the 14th of July, 1933. Conditions such as mentally disturbed, schizophrenia, depressed, deaf, disabled, alcoholics were targeted by the law. Tribunals on hereditary health were set up composed of two doctors and a judge. Under the Nazi regime, they carried out the forced sterilization of 400,000 people. Do you remember the genetic health courts? Yes, I was there with my father. Was it there that you were operated on? Sorry? Were you operated on in Munster? Yes, exactly. A crime. A crime against a German woman. Against a healthy German woman. Do you know why the doctors picked you? I was a so-called epileptic. I had a boyfriend. He left me. Why? He learned that I could no longer have children, so he left. And my parents, quiet as a tomb. My parents were really, you mustn't tell anyone. I had a cousin in Munster who I wanted to visit. No, she mustn't know. It was the same everywhere. We had to shut our mouths about it. I've lived like this up to today. The forced sterilizations were carried out on the Jews, gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, prostitutes, homosexuals, and a large group that was considered as social misfits. All that are the records of the genetic health courts, all these boxes that you see here. I suggest you look at the questions asked in the intelligence test. They were rather absurd. What land does my municipality belong to? Capital of Germany, capital of France, who were Luther and Bismarck? The intelligence test that the doctors gave was to determine if the patient was innately feeble-minded. I was sterilized for being innately feeble-minded. The anesthetist had said, tell me, why have you been chosen for this forced sterilization? I looked at him. Still today, I don't know why. I still don't know why. All of that because of the outcome of a wrong treatment. I couldn't say the difference between a stream and a river, between a ladder and stairs. That was enough cause to sterilize a child. Up until today, I have never understood why. 
That means that at 14 years of age, I was an adult. At 14, at 14, I knew perfectly well what they had done to my life and how my life would unfold. Schizophrenia and innate feeble-mindedness. Statistically, we've seen these two diagnoses come back again and again in the records. Yes. It's really the... These are very vague names. Yes. And that's why they were used so often. We couldn't establish a criteria. We couldn't prove any of it. But then these people had to live with this diagnosis for the rest of their lives when they didn't have anything. You have here documents that witness the subsidies that the Rockefeller Foundation poured into it. From 1936, the heads of the Rockefeller Foundation cut off the funding. They claim that further financial assistance is impossible because there was no longer an independent science. They argue that the funding could be viewed as supporting the legitimization of the National Socialists. We Are Not Alone was the propaganda carried out by the Nazis in 1936. If the eugenic laws didn't end up being adopted by the English government despite several attempts, nor by Catholic countries after the Pope intervened in 1930, they were, in fact, at the time of the Berlin Olympic Games being enforced in the United States, in Denmark, in Switzerland, Finland, Norway, and in Sweden. It was in 1936 that the Nazis shot the eugenic propaganda film called Erbkrank on hereditary diseases. Was there a rupture between the T4 action and what happened from 1939? Yes, of course, in the sense that they don't stop at just sterilizing and now go to the point of death. At the same time, there was a continuity because it was in using this law that the Nazis started to think that the laws weren't enough and they needed to take a more radical step. They needed to be at war so that Nazis could go from sterilization to a veritable political massacre. When Hitler launched the program T4 in October 1939, no part of it would be official. It was a secret program, top secret to only the personnel involved with no photography nor witnesses allowed. It's here, at 4 Tiergarten Street in Berlin, that the administrative headquarters of the T4 program is found. The patients were selected based on their medical records. This is the former hospital in Boch. As a child, I came here to visit my mother. It's a vague memory now. I no longer know in which building. There were patients everywhere, everywhere in these beautiful buildings. The patients could work outside, in the garden. It was certainly by this alley that the patients were transported to their deaths. The bus would pass with covered up windows, so we couldn't see in. So nobody could witness the patients being transported away.
For my mother, she was committed to a sanatorium in Berlin for depression, for a simple depression. The patients would receive a marking on their backs, which indicated that they were ready to be taken to their deaths. All this was done by the doctors. My mother was transferred to Bernburg, like many patients in Borch. It's located in the south of Germany, in Saxe. It was also a hospital where a center had been constructed for putting people to death using gas. Men, women and children were brought here. We counted a total of 33 hospitals, hospices, rest homes, which delivered their patients to this institution. Then the groups were taken down to the basement by a caregiver on the very day they arrived. I'll take you there. For the mentally ill, we use the expression feeble-minded. We find it often used. And for the psychologically ill, the diagnosis was often labeled as schizophrenia. But this covered a wide range of symptoms, which today would be classified differently. The victims were hurried down this corridor, then directly put in the gas chambers. The murders took place between January 1940 and July 1941, that's to say, over 18 months. 75,000 victims were put to death in an experiment of racial purification for German society as a prelude to the racial purification for European society. When the T4 program was stopped in August 1941, officially following Monsignor von Gallen's sermon, the Bishop of Munster, it seemed that the T4 program was stopped because it had achieved its goals, but in reality it continued under another name and in other places. My sister Irma was a child with a handicap, which I never noticed. A neighbor denounced us. This family has a child who is not normal. Irma was examined by a psychiatrist who wrote, feeble-minded child, totally idiotic. And she was, I'm sure, far from being an idiot. Irma and 228 other young girls were deported the 16th of August 1943 to a psychiatric hospital called Am Steinhof in Vienna. The children there suffered from very bad treatment. In the documents I've managed to pull together during the years, we can see how in August 1943, Irma weighed 40 kilos, and in the space of two months, her weight dropped to 28 kilos. When you imagine a 13-year-old child loses 12 kilos in two months, we know she must have been starved.
In general, historians have calculated around 200,000 psychiatric patients that died on German territory from euthanasia. Im großen Schwurgerichtssaal zu Nürnberg begann genau ein Jahr nach der Eröffnung des ersten großen Kriegsverbrecherprozesses die erste Verhandlung gegen 23 führende nationalsozialistische Ärzte. The famous trial of doctors at Nuremberg, where 23 went to trial, of which 20 were doctors, out of 90,000 German doctors, is not even the tip of the iceberg. None of the psychiatrists nor pediatricians responsible for euthanasia were held accountable at the trial at Nuremberg. The authors of these crimes committed justified it by considering the patients social misfits, useless and soulless. And they used the same terms during the trial in the middle of the 1960s. It means that more than 15 years after the end of the Second World War, practically nothing had changed. We've hardly given a thought to those patients who died in this hospital in Borch in the last few decades. Over the last 60 years, some are even opposed to constructing a monument in the memory of the victims, lest it tarnishes the reputation of Borch. Here would be an ideal place for a commemorative memorial. Because we can see the old hospital in the background. The idea that these people were crazy still persists today. On the 7th of February 1957, the government in the Bundestag declared the law of preventing hereditary diseases of the 14th of July 1933 is not a law typically of the National Socialists, as even in democratic countries such as Sweden, Denmark, Finland, or even some states in the USA, this law seems to exist. Even though eugenics stopped in Germany after 1945, it continued on a smaller scale in Scandinavian countries and in the United States. After World War II, North Carolina really began increasing dramatically the number of people sterilized to the point that we ranked third of all states for the total number of sterilizations. When we look at North Carolina's impacted eugenics population, we're looking at nearly 7,600 people who were sterilized from 1929 through 1974. And as you can see, our chart peaks in the 1950s and 1960s. So when we're discussing that we have victims as young as 10 years of age, boys and girls, then that brings us to the conclusion that we have a significant number of people who are in their 50s and 60s and still very viable people with us today. In 2002, when they uh, had found the files of the eugenics program, and they found out that the state of North Carolina had sterilized 7,600 people, most of them against their will. Before I found out, I thought that I was the only person that it happened to. I was embarrassed, I was humiliated, I was degraded. I would not, I ended up being on Prozac and Sarah Quetel. So the North Carolina Justice for Sterilization Victims Foundation was started in March of 2010 to serve as a central location and clearinghouse for people who were victimized through the state's eugenics board program. There were at least two states which increased the number of sterilizations that they did after the 1950s. Virginia was one, the second was North Carolina. 
It was a matter of pride for many of the doctors who carried out those sterilizations that they were preventing people who were on welfare from having further children. Fourteen years old. Cut, cut me like a hog. And they operated on me in 48. 64 years ago. And do you remember the, the day of the operation? No, the only thing I remember, they, they, they put a mask on my face, you know, and she told the nurse, you know, told me to sing a song, you know. I remember doing that, you know. And you were in Kingston? Kingston, yeah. Caswell Training School down there. Why came you to this school? The way, the way I found, Mama here saved, saved kids, you know, and it was hard for her, on her, you know, to take care of all of us, you know. So to separate me and my two sisters, two sisters went over to Jerk, Virginia, and they kept me, put me down in the Kingston, North Carolina. From what I was told, I was supposed that I couldn't get out of that school not unless I let, unless Mama signed a paper for me to have the operation. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't leave without that. Ah, it was a condition to leave the school? Yeah, 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 I had to be operated on before I could leave the school. And when did you leave the school? In 1951. Human Betterment League. So the movement here was supported by prominent families and doctors. They would distribute uh, things like uh, pamphlets talking about um, morons and how morons shouldn't reproduce um, and yeah, huge propaganda machine. This association was created in 1947, one of its goals to take care of the mad and feeble-minded. Here's an editorial. So this person had my job, whoever wrote this, had my job in 1947. There are 6,000 school children in Virginia schools who are unable to progress further than the third grade. Certainly these feeble-minded should not be allowed to reproduce. Their descendants are certain to become charges of the state. So this is somebody that, that had my job writing that slop. The sterilization laws were in force from 1935 to 1976, but no one protested at that time. The Social Democrats, uh, they were interested in the quantitative amount. It was a kind of a social work to pure the society from uh, the poorest uh, persons. Starts here, the applications for sterilization. Here and to this. It's both of it's both women and men. And children too. The reason is 
The reason is, she couldn't take care of children, herself nor her family. She is diagnosed being feeble-minded since birth. It was not a compulsory sterilization law. The doctors were having a consent from the sterilized person, so to say. But there were oppressions, perhaps? Absolutely. And the person here had something called dementia paralytics. The person is dement. Well, is that what you mean, an intelligence test? And if the result was that the intelligence was below 12 years age, then they could, uh, the doctors could sterilize uh, the persons without their consent. And in another application uh, which I have here, here I have only the school teacher. Here she is talking about the girl. She is 14 years old and that the girl had left the school for several times and uh, she is sexually unreliable and uh, her face, how she looks, uh, is not nice. She is also said to be absolutely feeble-minded. And th this application is made in 1947. And uh, the girl is sterilized without her consent. <laughs> the single mothers, they were a major part of the sterilized in the beginning of the 50s because the women got also the child allowances. And this could be a risk for the society that the mothers will have more children to get the money. All in all, it's 63,000 sterilized during the period. The main part are after the Second World War. Science had said that this is useless. Uh, so how slow are we to react or to change or to, uh, to uh, accept that we had done something wrong? So those, that machinery in itself is, is interesting. In 1997, after an important debate, the Swedish government compensated the victims of eugenics. And were many victims compensated? No, not so many. And they had also to prove that uh, they were sterilized by force or involuntary. And that is quite difficult when you have signed an application. How could you show the pressure in the situation? It's not in the files. Uh, there is a discussion in Sweden about uh, the sterilization laws, if it is a part of the bad black history and the dark history of the welfare state. Uh, but uh, I think it is a part of the welfare state. And each county would have a Department of Public Welfare. Social workers that worked for that would notice poor families, poor people that might be targets of sterilization. They would fill out a petition. They would call them feeble-minded and they would say they were promiscuous, often based on gossip. If they were epileptics, if they were blind, they would go for them. And basically, if anyone in the community, it could be the sheriff, it could be the social worker, it could be your doctor, it could be your parent, it could be your husband, your mom, any relative. If anyone in the community said, I believe that this person should be sterilized, they would send a petition to the state's eugenics board. It was in this building that the famous commission had its headquarters. No trace remains. Have you heard about the story of uh, eugenics? Or things like that? No? Mommy. Nothing? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't really know anything about it. No? no. Have you heard something? I have heard something on the news. Uh, but okay. I'd really rather not talk about that right now. Huh. You better get somebody else. <laughs> yes. Yes. You have. Yeah. I grew up in the eastern part, the northeastern part of the state. 
I personally know a family in a rural area of North Carolina that were very affected and are very almost afraid. They don't want to, they, as they put it, they don't want to rock the boat. You know, they depend on assistance from the state. I just know that um, they would tell, that a long time ago, certain officials would tell minorities um, that they had to get sterilized in order to receive uh, welfare benefits. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, it, oh. that's it. As the years started to progress, you started to also see in the 1950s and 1960s a huge increase in the number of African American women who were t starting to be termed as unfit. The object of sterilization in North Carolina was not, I think, primarily to satisfy eugenic doctrine of improving the quality of the, of the population, but to save money. Birth control pills made me sick. Our doctor said that he had something, a birth control plan that would be wonderful. So I went on in the hospital, had the surgical procedure, came out of the hospital and went on with my life and my three kids. This is in 1972. In 1976, and I go back to have it undone. But when I meet this man, and I get ready to remarry, and I go back because I want to have the surgery undone, he laughs. He thinks it's funny. And he tells me then, I'm sterile. And then he laughs again, and I keep telling him, no, 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 that's not what I signed for. That's not what you said. If it had been done to me legally, there would be medical records somewhere. I would have a medical record somewhere saying that I had had, I was sterilized. Why did he perform the surgery? Because he could. He could play God with people's lives. So they actually became, and I guess in their own minds, God. So they could pick and choose and do and not have to ever face the consequences. But now... In 1980, the German government granted 5,000 Deutschmarks to compensate the victims of the eugenic laws of July 1933. 5,000 marks. 5,000 marks. For the suffering endured, for the theft of their fertility. 5,000 marks. That's a shame. It's nothing. It's not recognition. And they had to fight until 2007 to be recognized as victims, victims of the Nazis. Their fight lasted till 2007. They started in 1945, 1955, 1965, 1975, 1985, 1995, 2005. When you add up all these decades since 1945, that adds up to many years. We have just come to the resolution concerning the proposition from the CDU, SCU and the SPD titled Rejection of the Law on the Prevention of Hereditary Diseases, July 14, 1933. Who is for this resolution? Against? Abstentions? The resolution is passed. In July 2012, the Senate in North Carolina opposed compensating the victims of eugenics. But it took us 10 years to get to this point. We started on this process in 2003. We would have been the first state out of 38 states to compensate the victims. All the way in the other room. Well, disappointed is not a strong enough word. I just um, can't find the word right now. But uh, I was very, very, uh, angry 
that North Carolina would not do what was morally right to compensate people that they had consciously violated. And, and I have people that tell me they know someone or one of their cousins or their uncles or their aunts, something like that, but they don't know specifically if they are listed. And that's going to be pretty bad because I'm not even listed. And what will happen for the victims who are not listed? Nothing. Nothing.